Jazz here, and I am so digging the Geek Cast Radio Network. This is Static. When Gear and I aren't fighting bang babies, we like to listen to the GeekCast Radio Network. Hello and welcome to the Secret Origins Podcast Tooncast Crossover Interview. I am your host, DFG and Mike, and joining me is Lupus Convoy. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Yes. Amazing, amazing things have happened. I never thought this day would happen. <laughs> I, I I do wish it would have happened when Secret Origins was still running, when we were still going through our episodes, but I'm super, super excited. I just finished an interview with Jason Marsden, who voiced Gear in Static Shock. He also voices Max Goof uh, from uh, the Goofy cartoons and, and A House of Mouse and a Goofy movie and all that. Um, and I had mentioned to, to, uh, to Jason that, oh, hey... You know, since you were gear, since you're Static's pal, can you help us out with getting to talk to who we're going to be talking to today? And that is none other than the great Phil Lamar. Oh. <laughs> it's like the Holy Grail. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, 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 it's going to be so awesome to talk to Phil. Uh, just I, 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 every time I see he is one of those. I've learned that he is. And it's more more so with his live action stuff, uh, his live action television and, and stuff like that. He is kind of like one of those quintessential guys that'll pop up in anything. Um, I don't know if you saw a few weeks ago. I don't. You don't watch The Big Bang Theory, do you? I do not. I I'll know. For shame. For shame. I'll have to send you the clip. But they were gonna have a guest spot with Lavar Burton. Oh, awesome. And 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 to me, Phil is that type of person that they'll, they'll just show up at at random in uh, in 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 live action television stuff like that. Uh, when I was doing research for this, I had no idea, no idea he was in an episode of uh, Wings as Gil the mechanic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember you telling me that, and it was like wings like that was a long time ago yeah i th th phil's just it's gonna be so awesome so do you have any thoughts before we get to the interview um i'm gonna be a little starstruck but <laughs> i i can't wait this is i think this is gonna be a really fun interview oh yeah it's gonna be so so fun i got a vibe tells me i should be sitting in on this scene for a while hello and welcome to the geek cast radio network's interview i am mike blanchard joining me is michael caminiti how are you sir Doing good. Today we have the great privilege of talking to Green Lantern from Justice League and Jazz from Transformers Animated, as well as like a million other things that he has done, Mr. Phil Lamar. Hello, sir. How are you? I'm good, Mike. How are you? Very good. Very good. What uh, do you have any up? What what current projects are you doing right now? Can you fill us in on what what's going on in the world of Phil Lamar? We're uh doing uh, more Clone Wars episodes. Uh, I play uh, Bail Organa and Kit Fisto on uh, Star Wars The Clone Wars. Um, we just finished up um, the ADR on um, Futurama, um, but it looks like we might have some more Futurama to do um, uh, very soon. Awesome. So we'll, That's uh, good news. Yeah, nothing... Uh, Nothing on paper for me yet, but uh, but uh, there's talk. Talk is always good. <laughs> it's, be it's better than not talk. Yeah, what's the uh, yeah. Oscar Wilde saying? It's like, the only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. Yeah. My thing is, I'd rather get a no than no answer at all. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, just to get us started, can you give us like a quick summary of your upbringing and how you became a voice actor and got into acting in general? I mean, I didn't realize how much acting you've like actual on camera acting you've actually done. I just sought out uh, Gil the mechanic from the episode of Wings that you did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
No, I was um, I I'm, I was primarily uh, a stage and uh, TV actor for for many years. Although my very first professional job uh, that I got my uh, SAG, uh, Screen Actors Guild union card on was uh, a cartoon I did when I was in high school, the Mr. T cartoon. Oh yeah. Uh, oh wow. It was a really, really bad cartoon. Um, you know, it was a, a Scooby-Doo knockoff, you know, designed to capitalize on Mr. T's popularity. You know, he had a serial, he had a cartoon. You got, back back then, you know, in the 80s, you know, you merchandised across the board if you could. Yeah, we um, are Transformers fans. We know all about merchandising. Oh, yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I did that uh, when I was in high school. And then didn't really do voiceover um, for many, many, many years. Mm. Um, I, I would talk with uh, you know my fellow actor friends about, we really got to get into voiceover. Okay. And then never do it. Um, <laughs> it wasn't until after I was on uh, Mad TV um, that I started uh, doing voiceover, partially because we were doing uh, animation on the show. We had a lot of claymation pieces that they used the cast as right. the voices of, and uh, and just having that bit of time behind the mic, I think, really helped. You know, when yeah. I actually started pursuing, you know, real animation. Yeah, one of the uh, one, one of the fir- one of the Mad TV skits I watched in in prep for this was um, the the Thanksgiving episode. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> That was, uh, yeah. God, what was the name of that one? More uh, or something like that. Yeah, it was, I remember it was written by a woman named Jenna Jolovitz. That was a fun sketch. Yeah, that 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 was really really funny. Since you kind of mentioned like like how much of a trend, I mean, how much of a transition was it from leaving Mad TV in, into jumping right into voice acting? Well, they they actually sort of overlapped. Um, mm-hmm. The people who cast. Mad TV also cast Futurama, and uh, that's how Dave Herman and I got uh, brought aboard. Um, and I think that was actually while we were doing um, Mad TV. Still, I know Dave was doing King of the Hill a lot at the same time he was doing Mad TV, um, and I, th- I think I'd started to do a couple of shows before Mad TV ended, including Futurama. Mm-hmm. Um, and Family Guy came out of Mad TV. Uh, I do voices on that. Um, the Fox executive who was who worked with Mad TV had found this young kid named Seth MacFarlane. And she asked us, as a fa- me and Alec Borstein, as a favor to do some voices for this presentation this guy was going to you know, put together to try to sell the show to Fox. And you know that that sell that sale went really well. <laughs> I, I can't imagine it not. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, in, if you look look at where it is now, yeah, I mean, yeah, all the popularity. Yeah, one of the most successful uh, primetime animated shows ever. Um, if you could still be working on one show that you've worked on in the past, what show would that be? Um, Samurai Jack. Just because it was, it was such, a, it was just such a a good show. It's the kind of show that I could show to anybody and know that they wouldn't be turned off to it, even if they didn't find it, you know, something that they wanted to continue to watch. There was always something to appreciate. Either it was the artistry, um, the the humor, the action, um, just the design of it. I mean, it appealed on so many levels to so many people, like women, you know, adults, children, whoever. There was something there that I think everybody could, you know, latch on to. I, I used to, when I could watch it, um, I thought it was just amazing. Like, not just the animation and everything, but also the voice acting that you and the rest of the, the crew had. And I, I do have to say that Scotsman is one of my favorite characters. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, those those were just great episodes. Uh, on the flip side of that, and I hate asking this question, um, in general, what are some of your uh, favorite and least favorite shows that you've worked on? 
Um, my least favorite shows are the ones where the checks don't clear. And fortunately, <laughs> I, I haven't had any of those. <laughs> That's good. Um, you know, there's you know, there's always going to be stuff that, you know, you're more into or less into. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but there, there are some shows that I wouldn't watch that I've worked on, but that my kids would love. I mean, uh, and then there's, you know, the opposite. There's shows my kids watch. Like, my kids watch a show called Word Girl, which I just love. I would, I would, I would kill to to do a voice on that because it's so much fun. Um, I'm trying to think. No, there's not really. I mean, voiceover is. It's such a fun job. Even if the show isn't great, you're usually working with great people. So it's hard to to you know bear the kind of negativity needed to answer that question. <laughs> You know, well, I, I, you know, on the on the flip side of least favorite, what, what what about some of your favorites that you've worked on? I mean, it it was it was a question for both. I mean, what about like some of your like the ones you most enjoyed working on? Um, Justice League, because I mean, I grew up as a DC Comics reader. Um, I was not a, a big Green Lantern fan uh, as a kid. Um, I was a Batman guy, um, but. Being able to do that show and, I mean, the way they used, you know, DC history and comic book continuity uh, and deviated from it and, in fact, in many ways made it better mm-hmm. uh, was just a joy as a comic book fan, you know, because you'd be sitting there reading a script and go, ah, I know where this got, I know where they got this storyline. <laughs> uh, How many times and, did I do that? Yeah, but, yeah. And everybody, you know, the people who worked on it were so talented. You know, Bruce Tim and Dwayne McDuffie and, you know, and the artists. I mean, some of the artists they had working on Justice League were people that I was huge fans of, you know, as a comic. I'm like, oh, my God, he's here. You know, <laughs> got to take my book and go upstairs. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, Justice League was definitely one of my favorites. Um, Samurai Jack. Um, Clone Wars uh, is great. It, it's funny because the Clone Wars micro series, um, I think that that actually killed Samurai Jack, <laughs> <laughs> um, brought me back to Star Wars. Yeah, you know it was just so good. Um, I'm trying to think what other favorites. Um, Futurama, although it's funny because at this point, it feels more like just a part of my life than than a show. Yeah, I've been doing it for you know. Going on, I think more than ten years. Yeah. Once you get shows that are like that, it, you know, it it seems like it's a part of everyday life, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. You know, and uh, I always find that you don't really settle into a character until after you see it fully realized and animated. You know, because the voice is really only one part of the character. I mean, we're yeah, we're we're part of this huge collaborative. I mean, you know, the backgrounds are as important as the voice. I mean, no one of them by themselves would mm-hmm. really be worth watching. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so we all have to work together. And it's always m- so hard to do a show at the beginning because you're, you, I just can't seem to get a solid handle on the character. The, you know, the, the scripts are always different. But once I see it, like, oh, that's the show. All right, let's go do it. You know, <laughs> from that point on, which is usually a year in, yeah, it's the process is from from my aspect, from my uh, perspective, is always so much easier. Uh, out of all the characters that you've either voiced or, or, or played in, in live action, I mean, what are some of your absolute favorite characters that you've done? Oh, live action. Uh, anything, live action, voice acting, any anything. What are some of the favorite characters of, of your like characters that you can look back on and say, I really, really enjoyed doing that, or I really, you know, liked where that character went. Um, hmm. Well, really, honestly, the most rewarding characters, I think. I mean, of course, you ask me tomorrow, I might get a different answer. Um, but uh, John Stewart, just because of the breadth of what I got to play as that character. I mean, over the four seasons, I mean, that's without a doubt the best writing and the best, you know, dramatic arcs that I've as a performer ever gotten to play. Um, 
you know, he was on trial for murder. He was in a love triangle, you know, he had to, with somebody who was trying to take over the world. You know, I mean, there was a lot of really good, fertile stuff to, to act there. Um, I, th- I so think my favorite John Stewart line is, and you can kiss my axe. <laughs> oh, right. That's so funny. Um, I think the, and the, the other aspect, uh, the, uh, the UPS guy, a uh, character I did on mad TV is also one of my favorites. Um, just cause that's something I started doing on stage at the groundlings. And again, I got to do the character over time and let it evolve. And that's, that's really rare, you know, um, that you get a chance to really live with a character and, you know, what help, help it grow. Mm. You've most of the stuff that I've seen you voice and voice acting has mostly been like good guys and heroes and all that good stuff. But what like as far as I know, you haven't really had a chance to do villainous characters. I, I could be wrong in that, but like what type of characters do you prefer? Good guys, bad guys, you know, serious type of characters or funny characters? Um, I prefer well written characters, but but you are wrong. Okay. Well, that's that's fine. Um, I I played uh, Vamp in uh, Metal Gear oh, Solid. Oh, that's right. Who's pretty much a bad guy. Yeah, he's he's pretty much e- evil incarnate. Wow, I forgot <laughs> about Vamp. <laughs> oh. Um, but I'm trying to think. Uh, no, you're right. In general, I think I tend to not play. I don't play as many heavies as I do heroes yeah and and when i said that i was thinking more towards cartoons i hadn't even thought of vamp and then i had found out in 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 doing research i was like wow phil did vamp holy wow that's awesome (laughs) (laughs) yeah no i'm very proud of that one because it doesn't sound it certainly doesn't sound like me and it doesn't sound like uh you know many of the characters i've played there i mean there are there are a handful that are in the same or a similar vein, you know, Sig in Jack and Daxter, John Stewart, um, uh, uh, Chris in Mercenaries. That's a, another video game. They're in, uh, in a similar vocal range. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're you know distinct sounds, but you know they're both they're all big guys, you know, with deep <laughs> voices. Um, so what's so different about Vamp, like, with your own voice? Did did they use effects on that, or is that you doing a voice? It's, well, I, I think the, the main uh, thing, uh, no, there I don't think there were any effects. It's backwards. On Vamp, I'm mostly um, talking on the inhale instead of on the exhale. Well, my queen. You know, I, I'm basically taking in air almost as I talk. Oh, wow. I mean, not literally, um, but it's restricting the flow of air so much. Um, it makes it really hard to to give it any volume, but it also gives it that. It gives him that creepy feeling. You know? <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Because it, I mean, basically, it it sounds like he's dead. Yeah. He he's not a character that that has like a not. Not a high pitched tone, but he's not a character, as you said, that has a lot of volume. He's that he's that dark background type character. Right. Almost. Where his voice, when he talks, he's like he's in the background from, from all, all of the other characters in Metal Gear. Right, right. That's yeah, it's 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 fun to it's fun to play that. I mean, it's also I'm trying to think uh like the big loud. I mean, uh, there was a a show, uh, a video game. Um, is it Darkstalkers? Just came out last year. Or I play, you know, uh, not a hero or a villain, but like th- the evil exposition guy. <laughs> you know, where's you? You know, it's like a, a, the uh, Tales of the Crypt kind of voice. Um, <laughs> and that the best thing about that one was. He doesn't fight. So you don't have to do any death screams. Yeah. <laughs> That's always got to be a perk when you're doing the Foley and the 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 sound effects of being punched and, and kicked and in comparison to something like Jon Stewart where you always have to make those little quips and, oh, could you well, do it like you're getting hit in this area of the body instead? 
Well, that's yeah. I mean, uh, Justice League. We had a lot of fighting noise and grunts and strains. Not as much as a video game, just because you're not doing you know six hours of mm-hmm. f- record animation, um, but thirty minutes. The the toughest thing about Justice League, especially at the beginning, was the ring. You know. <laughs> It's a it's a power ring. It's it's about willpower, but it's an animated show, so there needs to be a sound when he does something. But logically, I had a really hard time uh, justifying. It's like, well, why does he have to make a sound when he's beaming something? You don't make a sound when you like turn on a light switch. You know that's what it is. It's it's will. It's 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 mental. It's like no, just we need a we need a strain. Like all right. And his arm's really heavy. (laughs) But if you think about it, like, a Green Lantern ring really should be the most silent weapon ever. Yeah. Very true. I I guess I'd have to agree on that. (laughs) You know, I mean, mean, there's actually even a question of would it make a sound when it struck something? Yeah. But I guess it's, it's a solid light thing, so... Or is it? I don't know. Or is it just a manifestation of the will? Is he moving that thing with his mind? I, I think it's a manifestation of a solid hologram moved by his mind, but... That's what I, I want. I want the invisible... <laughs> give me the invisible ring. It's like, yeah, I don't think I just see, like, a giant green hammer. I just want to, just like, I'm going to point my ring and push him away. How about that? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Although I love the fact, because they made a conscious decision... Um, on Justice League, that John Stewart did not make shapes. Not until later he didn't. Yeah, you know, uh, it was like because because they were you know this was a military guy, this was a no nonsense guy. He's not going to make a boxing glove or a a bow and arrow. He's like, yeah. no, I'm going to make a beam. If I need to <laughs> shoot at somebody, I will make a beam. Yeah. <laughs> um. Um, you want to take the next one there, Lupus? Uh, sure. Um, so how did you fall into Samurai Jack? Uh, the show won several Emmy uh, Awards and nominations. And do you, did any of your other roles have nominations to their credit? Um, uh, Samurai Jack, I believe, was uh, a simple audition. Um, it's funny because I do remember that I auditioned for it at the same recording studio where I auditioned for Samurai, uh, for Static Shock at a different time. That, but uh, but no, they were both just things that I went in with a bunch of other guys and we all tried out for it and uh, I got picked very, very fortunately. Um, yes, so, uh, Futurama has uh, won a, a few Emmys, I believe. Um, Static Shock won a Humanitas Award for an episode we did about... Uh, gun violence in in a school um which is a really really powerful episode mm, i remember hearing about that yeah it's so good that show that show was really vastly underrated that uh, show is is a really good it's got a lot of social commentary stuff i mean it, it hits on a lot of hard issues yeah occasionally um but mostly it's funny because um uh, Dwayne McDuffie, who uh, just passed away recently, you know, co-created uh, the the character, and it's funny. I think because of because the character was a young black guy, uh, it seemed like it was taking on, you know, or had more of an agenda than it otherwise might have, um, because most of the episodes were really just about you know, him dealing with his life, you know, his sister who annoys him trying to keep, you know, the the identity a secret, you know, you know, trying to impress the girl, but without, you know, I mean, the same, many of those storylines could be in a Spider-Man comic. Um, And occasionally we really did, you know, make specific use of, you know, the character's racial uniqueness. Um, There's one episode at the beginning of, I think, third season or fourth season where uh, Virgil, the the character's family, goes to Africa and he right. encounters 
an African superhero and an African villain. Um, and it was, it's funny because, again, that could be any character. You know, I guess Peter Parker could have gone to England. It's like, well, your your great grand uncle lives here, and you know, and encountered somebody. But I think when you when you make it Africa, people think of it as more of a political thing, you know. But really, it, most of the time, it was just stories. Um, and certainly, that story about a, a gun in a school um, could could apply to anybody. But I also what you're talking about, I think, is part of the DNA of the character because milestone. Um, the the line of comics where that static came out of was rooted in a social consciousness. You know, the the creators really made an effort to have ethnic diversity and you know as well as economic diversity. I mean, they were thinking about it consciously, whereas right. the vast majority of comic books had that stuff in them, but it was unconscious. You know, Bruce Wayne, a wealthy millionaire, you know, like <laughs> that's not a comment on Depression era economic policies. You yeah. Know? <laughs> you know, although nowadays, I guess somebody might think might think it was. Um, um, OK, so what was your favorite exclamation they had you say on Futurama? I don't know. Uh, I don't really have a I mean, the one that I remember the most, I think, was the first one. You know, Great Lion of Zion. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, after that. You didn't really get invested because you knew it wasn't coming back, uh, but it was really just the, to see how they were up to the challenge of creating more. You know, I think in the last uh, season, did we? Did I even have any? It's it's definitely tapered off. Yeah, I think the the well might be close to running dry. Oh, that that stinks. <laughs> oh. well, so kind of like I, the the pinky in the brain, where you know what's what's going to happen this week. Right. <laughs> But I, I think that I'm, I'm sure, you know, David and David Cohen and the writers have, have yet to disappoint. So I'm, I bet you they've got some uh, packed away uh, somewhere. Uh, what was it like playing two radically different characters between Static and, and Green Lantern, uh, even sometimes in the same episode? Like, I know you were adult Static in, uh, oh, what was he? oh gosh, I should know this. I did a podcast on it, I should know. <laughs> once in Future Thing, the Once in Future Thing part two where you were adult static and you were also uh, John Stewart. What's it like playing those two different, very different characters in, in the same same place, same episodes? Well, oh, God, it was always a blast. Anytime I got to have the characters cross over because uh, GL came into a couple of static episodes yep. and static went into, uh, I think, a one – GL episode, uh, Justice League episode, and although the biggest challenge was the the one you're talking about, because for me, I always want the voices to sound distinct. Right. You know, uh, it's funny because a lot of people say, "Oh, I can always tell when it's you," which I appreciate the spirit of what they're saying, like, "Oh, thank you," but really, in my gut, that's the worst thing for me to hear. <laughs> Well, but I won't tell great. you that because honestly, every time I I see you do, I, I've seen something you've done. I'm like, well, wait, that was Phil Lamar. No way. See that I love to hear. That I love because I I really do, you know, strive to not go over the same ground. Right. Um, but it's difficult. I mean, you know, the human voice only has so many you know variations. Um, so when I had to do John Stewart. And an adult static. I mean, John Stewart and kid static. That's 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 easy. That's cake. That's you know, you know, you put, place one down here, and that's you know, you, that's a very low. And the other placement is real is real high. I mean, even if I didn't make an effort right. to separate them, you're, those two voices are going to sound different. Yeah. But now you say, well, take this voice and make them fifty years old. It's like, oh, okay. Um, so I've got to figure out what that guy sounds like grown up. And not only grown up, but aged. And make sure it doesn't sound anything like Jon Stewart. Which is really more the challenge I put on myself. I don't think anybody else was saying, well, they can't sound anything alike. But I really didn't want them to sound alike. Right. Um, so 
the 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 trick was to give static the texture of a 50 year old man but not the same texture that John Stewart has mm-hmm. you know which you know John Stewart is younger and more vital you know he's got a deep voice and you know you've got a little bit of that rumble behind it so and also at this point they had established that static was the almost the most powerful hero on the planet so i got to take take his energy down to you know something like almost godlike you know he's not expending a lot of energy so i made him a little calmer and i made his speaking voice i i pitched it in a made it a higher register mm-hmm. you know cuz my thinking was if you talk like this when you were 14 or 15 your voice isn't suddenly going to go down here you know <laughs> your voice is just you're going to grow up you're going to become a man you're going to start you know talking you know as an adult and then you'll slowly become older and add a little texture but your voice won't get lower it'll just become a different voice you know that's so cool that's amazing <laughs> so that and and fortunately, it uh, I I was pretty pleased with with how it turned out. Um, we talked earlier about your ties to Star Wars. Um, as far as the Clone Wars, did you try to do a Jimmy Smith impre- impersonation for Bail Organa, or how did you make it your own? Uh, no, no, no. the The idea was um, to to do Jimmy Smiths um, because they wanted the characters you know that were established in the movie in the movies to be carried over into the animated series. We're all, although I think they've all shifted over time. I mean, when uh, James Arnold Taylor started doing Obi-Wan, you know, he was consciously doing a Ewan McGregor impression. Mm -hmm. But I, I would venture to guess that if you played what he's doing as Obi-Wan now up against Ewan's Obi-Wan, it probably sounds fairly different. Right. Um, and I'm sure the same is true of my Bail Organa. It's, we, we've all basically sort of, we started with, you know, the voices of the, the movie actors, and then as you get different storylines and they do different things, the voices change, you know? Right. Um, well, Kit, Kit Fisto, fortunately, didn't have a voice in the movie. He was played by a woman. Um and uh, it's funny because I you look at Anakin in Clone Wars, and there's not really a disconnect. You don't think, "Hey, that doesn't sound anything like the Anakin in the prequels." Um, maybe it's because I don't know people maybe aren't as invested in the Anakin in the prequels um, vocally. Um, but yes, I was doing my best, my best Jimmy Smith's impression. Captain Antilles, these droids will go with you. And I want the protocol droids mind wiped. You know. That's um, awesome. Oh, wow. That's so awesome. Okay, so how do you feel about zombies since you are on the Walking Dead motion comic? Um, you know what's funny? I've never been a big zombie media person. Um, you know, I, I remember playing Resident Evil early, you know, like two in the arcades, <laughs> you know, being appalled by the, the voice acting. Um, but I'm not big into zombies, but when I started reading the Walking Dead comic, it was just hands down one of the best comic books of whatever kind I'd ever read. So because of that, I was really excited to be involved in the motion comic just to be involved in walking dead in any way shape or form was you know was a pleasure cool very awesome uh we are both huge transformers fans uh i think that's a little bit of an understatement uh yeah well considering my screen name is tfg1 mike yeah uh Right. Did you go back and watch any of the Generation 1 Transformers episodes to see what Scatman Carruthers had done with Jazz to get your own unique style for him in Transformers Animated? Did you do any – did you watch any of the previous incarnations of Jazz, or did you just bring your own thing to him? Um, well, 
No, I did not. Uh, one, because they said they didn't want it to sound like the old jazz. Okay. Um, I, and also, once you get Scatman Crothers in your head, you know, it's <laughs> stuck there. I mean, yeah. He's such a distinct voice, and he's such a good actor. You know, I mean, you know, it's it just... It, it would just be. I think it would have made it much harder to do what they wanted to do, which was give it a little separation from the previous, you know, uh, iteration, but tie it in. I mean, they wrote the character s- somewhat differently, mm-hmm. um, so it was basically just to to play the character as he was written now. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, because I would have I would have loved to have been able to do a Scatman Crothers. <laughs> that would have been. Megatron, uh, you're going down. You know, but <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I, I truly, I really, really love what you did with jazz. I mean, I love Scatman's version for what that was in that context of, of the the old cartoon. But just what you did with with jazz was just awesome. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, they they had a really cool take on it and a really specific idea. And it was it was fun to you know just bring that to life. Uh, I'm gonna put a link in the chat here to to a, a website for an action figure. Uh, do you own any of the action figures of the characters you've voiced or done at all? Um, let's see. I have a John Stewart uh, somewhere. Uh, now, what I've linked you I, to? Oh, and I have a I have a Samurai Jack maquette. Oh, cool. What I linked you to was they just announced this year at New York Toy Fair that more J- Justice awesome. League Unlimited uh, figures are coming this year, and they're going to do an adult static. Oh, yes. I think I heard about that. It that, looks so cool. Yeah, well, yeah, too little, too late. Um, no, there was always this uh, the rumor <laughs> that uh, the reason static was canceled was that we didn't have a toy deal. Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, because the, the ratings, I mean, we won our time slot, you know, years running. Mm-hmm. But, you know, in uh, network uh, Saturday morning uh, cartoons, a lot of times people say that the cartoons are a loss leader for the merchandise. Yeah. <laughs> they don't really care how the cartoon does as long as it sells <laughs> some toys. And, uh, yeah, and for some reason they... They never made any static toys. I think the only static toy prior to this one that's about to come out was like a Burger King giveaway. Yeah, I remember that. You know, which was which is a shame. Yeah, it's yeah. I I, I would have loved to have seen, especially in the JLU style of, of figures that they have for the Justice League Unlimited toy line now. Mm-hmm. Even though that toy line is ending this year, I would have loved to have seen like a a static and an Ebon and a Gear and. Gear could have backpack uh, yeah. as an accessory. That would have been so cool. No, absolutely. Um, but I, I don't know. I never understood that. I mean, there are so few teen heroes. Right. I, I would have thought it would have been a slam dunk. Yeah. You know. Uh, before uh, Michael asks his next question, I have to uh, – I'm a huge Phineas and Ferb fan, and I have ah. to give it. I have to give a shout out to the street performer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that show is so fun, and the guys, the guys who make it are so talented, uh, Swampy and Dan Povenmire. I mean, I've been fortunate to work with some really, really talented people. You know, uh, Gendy Tartakovsky, Matt Groening, David X. Cohen. You know, Swampy, Dan, Seth MacFarlane. You know, these guys are, you know. Adam Burton, they're all just really amazing writers, you know, very funny people. You know, most of them are artists as well, you know. And those guys also, you know, Dan and Seth, they can write, they can draw and do voices, you know. It's 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 kind of crazy. Um, every voice actor seems to have a method for remembering which of their voices go with which of their characters, especially if they're on a show where they voice a good deal of those characters, like Dead and King of the Hill, Futurama, and other shows. Um, how do you keep all of your voices straight? Um, usually, you try to find um, a line. Um, what do people call it? A key line or 
um, a hook, something that you know usually you say as the character early on when you're when you're first uh, uh, discovering where the voice is, and it helps you find the placement physically, you know, in your throat, and it helps you find the vibe of the character. Um, I know on uh, Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends, I played a character named Wilt. Right. And I knew whenever I went in, because a lot of times we had a big, we had big breaks mm-hmm. uh, between when we would record. We would record, and then like five weeks later, we'd do the next episode, mm-hmm. which makes it harder to hold on to the character. Yeah. So I would just have to go, oh, hey, I'm sorry. No, no, I'm, okay, okay. You know? <laughs> and... Uh, that would help me remember where I get that voice. And again, once you've been doing it for a while, it becomes a little easier. Yeah. Um, although I think sometimes you, the reason a voice changes, you know, cause you, you'll hear, you know, you listen to first season of something and then fourth season and there's a slight difference. I think sometimes that is because the voice is finding its natural place in the in the actor, you know, because you'll start out doing something. I'm doing this guy, and then maybe it, it hurts or it's not comfortable or you're not able to um, repeat it the same way as often. Or they write something for that character to do that this voice just can't express. So you know, oh, I'm sorry, and then all of a sudden the voice drops down to here. And so, like, by fourth episode, this voice becomes this voice. Yeah. And then it stays. And usually you'll find that it doesn't change after that unless, you know, you're, like, Mel Blanc and doing it 30 years later. <laughs> um, yeah, I love I love listening to, like, 70s Bugs Bunny versus 40s Bugs Bunny. It always cracks me up. <laughs> Uh, it, it, it's funny you answer that as far as um, how you keep track of it is, you you know, you just have to, you know, you know, get a line piece or something like that. Um, a funny thing that uh, when I talked to Jason Marsden the other day, he said, "Oh, they have this great thing at work called an archive, and they, you know, we just ask them to play us a line." <laughs> yes, yes. Well, that's the thing. I mean, you always hope that they have reference. Yeah. And most of the time, they do. Yeah. You know, if, especially if it's something you're doing regularly, but sometimes they don't. So you have to have you know something to fall back on. Yeah. You know, that's the that's the worst thing is that like you go in and it's a character like a secondary character that you did, you know, two seasons ago. Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh, and we brought back so and so. Great. <laughs> what does he sound like again? <laughs> and then like I, I I remember I think it was a couple of Futurama episodes where they brought back some like character from second season. We were doing one of the DVD movies and they're like, what does that guy sound like? Like, I don't know. And we had to actually send somebody to the office to get the DVDs that had been sold and find an episode. Oh, you wow. Know? And like, okay. All right, right, right. See, um, in the thousands of recordings you've done over your career, what are some of the funniest things, uh, whether it be mistakes someone made or practical jokes that someone pulled that you've had to uh, been a party to or a witness to? And just a preface before you answer this, you don't have to worry about whether we're a PG-13 network or not. Oh. So if you if it was something where it was something gross or, or, or inappropriate, we're all about inappropriate. Oh God! Well, there's two things that that come to mind. Uh, I remember when we were one is sort of just sort of an ongoing thing when we were doing Justice League. Um, Susan Eisenberg, who voiced Wonder Woman, just had such an incredibly sexy voice that. Uh, George Newburn and I, because we had our mics next to each other, sometimes she would say a line, completely innocuous line, but in that voice, it was just like hot. And like, <laughs> she would say it, and I would think, oh my God, that was hot. And I'd look over at George, and he'd have the exact same thought and the same look on his face. I'm like, right? He's like, right, I know, right? <laughs> you know, and so then you go, Joe's like, uh, I, I'm sorry, can, can, can you play that line back? And, and in fact, email it to me from my personal archives. Oh, no. <laughs> as far as, like, this was sort of a practical joke. I worked on a show called Evil Concarne, mm-hmm. um, 
Uh, Maxwell Adams uh, did it for uh, Cartoon Network as part of uh, it was Billy and Mandy and Evil Can Carne. Um, it was the Grim Adventures of uh, Billy and Mandy. Was, yeah, no, originally it was called Grim and Evil. Oh, you're right. Just, um, and uh, we were evil and they were grim. And then the show got half canceled. Our half. <laughs> oh, uh, that was the best part, though. <laughs> I loved Evil Concarne. Uh, uh, although Billy and Mandy was was funnier. I mean, that character of Billy is just so hilarious and silly. Um, but there was one time because Frank Welker, I, I was the disembodied brain of an evil mastermind um, that was attached to a dancing circus bear uh, voiced <laughs> by Frank Welker. Um, and of course, Boskov, the bear, didn't talk. He just made bear sounds, which Frank is amazing at. And um, I remember after one record, Frank was saying, oh, gosh, everybody here is so funny. We should do, we should do an improv episode where we, everybody just gets to, you know, really just play. And then they did it. You know, we came in one day and uh, Adam said, guess what? We're doing Frank's improv episode. And I turned to look at Frank. It's like, oh, great. Yeah, it's fine for you. All you got to do is grunt and growl. The rest of us actually have to make up <laughs> shit. <laughs> but there was one beat in the improv episode. Because uh, I, 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 they, what they gave us was a sheet with basically th- this is a scene where these, these three things happen. And then there's another scene where these three things happen. And then we would just make everything up within that context. And I remember at one point, uh, Hector Concarni says something to Boskov, like, Boskov, why don't you, and it was like this long, like, juggle that chainsaw while running around the, the base of the tree and doing a tumbling act. Like some long series of things mm-hmm. that the bear had to do. And, <laughs> you know, normally, because I'm an improviser, normally you don't do that because that's, that's fuck you improv. That's labeling your partner with something that is if not impossible incredibly difficult to do but i felt okay about it because bear doesn't talk all he has to do is like make some grunts and groans <laughs> but then frank welker proceeds to make a series of bear sounds that sound exactly like what i had laid out he did the sound of a bear juggling a chainsaw while running around i mean everything i just laid out he actually made it sound like he was doing with nothing but grunts and wow. growls. And it was absolutely just jaw-dropping. You know? So would you say that jaw-dropping explains Frank Welker and his awesomeness? Almost. Because jaw dro- jaw-dropping explains his talent. But it, all, it doesn't take into account the fact that... He's also one of the nicest, warmest, most genuine people you will ever meet. You know, so it's it's like if if Einstein was the quarterback and also, you know, the person who saved your life when you drove off the bridge. You know, he's just like so many good things all in one package. You know? Right, yeah. Because usually somebody who's that talented they make up for it in some in lacking something else, you know, be it humility or self awareness. Or you know, it's like, wow, he's really talented, kind of a dick, but you know, but he's he's all of it together, and it's it's amazing. Yes, it is so amazing. Kind of switching gears here a little bit. Uh, you've been to some of the various Comic Con and fan conventions and and stuff like that. How do you feel uh, about the conventions themselves, and how do you feel about just fans coming up to you and saying, oh, my God, I loved you in this, or, oh, my God, I loved you in that, or whatever. How, how, how does that make you feel when you're at these conventions? And do you go to the conventions sometimes just for yourself, or do you only go if you're asked to go? Um, I have, you know, like a family and, and kids, so, like, time is at a premium, so I don't get to go just for fun. Mm-hmm. Although, I mean, I would go to San Diego every year if, you know, time wasn't a factor. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, I mean, I would, I would like to go to most of the comic book conventions cause I am a comic book guy and, you know, getting to meet the people whose work I've been reading since, you know, I was a child is 
always just so much fun. I remember a couple of years ago, I got to present at the Eisner Awards at Comic-Con, and I got to meet Jerry Robinson, the guy who co-created The Joker. And it was just like, you know, it was a fanboy moment. It was amazing. And it's great um, getting to meet, you know, writers and artists, you know, get a drawing every now and again. Um, uh, as far as uh, meeting the fans, too, that's always really fun. Um, it's funny because I didn't realize that it actually is work <laughs> until I went to the first convention. And at the end of the day, I almost lost my voice. I'm like, why am I tired? I've been sitting down all day. <laughs> And then you realize, no, you've been talking for right. eight hours straight right? over the din of, you know, a convention floor. Yeah. You See, know, the funny which... thing for me is, like, you know, you're talking, you're talking about, you know, sitting somewhere and, 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 and just talking for a long amount of period of time. Uh, last year's San Diego, uh, I wasn't able to go, but um, a couple other podcasters and I got together. And as the news came in from the convention – I, I sat through an entire and talked through an entire six hour podcast. Oh wow! Covering what the news was that came out of San Diego Comic Con last year. <laughs> and wasn't it taxing? Honestly, no. No. For me, I can. I don't know. For some strange reason, I can sit here and I can podcast and I can as long as I have stuff I can talk about, I can sit here for hours on end and just do it. And you and you never get your. Uh, I've never lost tired. my voice. Great. I've I, I've been podcasting since 2008. Uh, with Geekcast Radio Network, we produce anywhere from five to twelve podcasts, sometimes weekly, and I'm a voice on most of them. And I don't know. It's just it's something where I've I've never ever lost my voice in the last three and a half four years. Right. Well, I mean, no. I mean, it takes a lot to lo actually lose your voice. Right. Um, although I I mean honestly, for most people, because it's funny because a lot of people will talk about voice. Everyone's like, I can do that. I talk all the time. And because <laughs> we do, all of us talk, you know, yeah. the vast majority of us. Right. Um, and it really does take a lot before you're even aware of your voice. You know, if you're screaming for 20 minutes, then you feel like, mm, wow. <clears throat> yeah, then you feel I it. Feel it. You know, I mean, generally, I, I've never had an issue in a animation session. You know, we, we go four hours. It's not a thing. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I remember that very first convention, just a lot of, Hey, how are you? And, and I realized after a while, I'm like, okay, I'm going to stand up when people come because then we're, we're talking face to face as opposed mm -hmm. to me sitting up at a, sitting at a table and ye yelling up to you over the, you know, mm -hmm. Maybe maybe next time I'll bring a microphone and an amp. <laughs> I think it'll be easier just to talk on a microphone. Hello. Hi. No, thank you very much for coming. I have to admit it is a funny mental image of you with a giant bullhorn just right. you know, exactly. shaking people's hands. Yeah. That's yeah, so I mean, awesome. The, the only, the only uh, bad thing about the conventions for me is because I do animation – and, you know, some of it is for kids. And you're out there signing and, you know, it's $20 for an autograph. And there'll be a child who actually likes one of the cartoons and, you know, he doesn't have 20 bucks. And you're just like, oh, hi, you know. Mm. And just like, I'm sorry, it's work. Um, that's, that's really the only downer. Um, getting to talk to people and, you know, hear how this stuff is, you know, positively affected their lives. I had one guy at, uh, we were at a con in, uh, Florida and he was talking about how, you know, he was in the Gulf, you know, fighting and he got to watch these animated stuff and, you know, the, the justice league stuff really meant a lot to him, you know, to have that, to remind him of home, to ground him and also to have that heroic image just, you know, helped him get through what he had to get through. And, you know, that is something that when you're in a booth recording, you know, words on a page, it, it would be very hard to conceive of, you know. Right, yeah. 
Yeah, I don't know. I, I enjoy the conventions. The the comic book. Con- I went to an anime convention once and felt very out of place because I don't <laughs> know because I, I don't know anime. Yeah, and it's funny because it sort of made me feel like a civilian at Comic Con. You know, like if people go by in these bizarre costumes, like if you know, you know, uh, that that's you know, um, Cyclops. It makes you know, it makes sense. Yeah. If you don't know, if somebody comes by with like a giant key or something, you're like, wow, they put a lot of work into that, and I have no idea what it is. You know. In in doing research, I just I just searched your name on on YouTube, and it came up with I don't know a convention from 2009 that you were at, and it was somebody interviewing you, and. I almost thought, wow, it's going to be like, you know, they're interviewing him, and all of a sudden, Maurice LaMarche pops into frame. And it's like, oh, wow, it's like impromptu voice acting session. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was so cool. Uh, what um, What is some advice you could give for people that want to get into voice acting and, and, and stuff like that? That's a tough one because everybody's path is different. I mean, I have friends who started out as stage actors. I have friends who started out as – uh, singers, friends who started out as recording engineers, mm-hmm. you know, and found their way into voiceover. Um, you know, some people have really distinctive voices. Uh, some people have really great performing skills. Um, and it's about, you know, strengthening your weaknesses and you know, accentuating your strengths, whatever they are. So it's, it's really hard to, to give general advice. Um, mm-hmm. My uh, my Facebook fan page, I because I got this, get this question a lot, and I've tried to turn the discussion board into kind of a clearinghouse of information. I've asked, you know, my friend Tommy Smeltzer, who started out as an engineer and got into voiceover, he says the first piece of advice he gives anybody is read out loud for an hour a day every day for three weeks, then come back to me. Right. You know, and and which is really good advice because one that gets you used to using your voice, hearing to hearing your voice, right. and reading. And the thing is, if you're not reading that with any sort of inflection and you know attitude and acting, you're going to get bored way before you finish that hour. <laughs> so you're going to have to get good in order to finish the exercise. Right. Um, and he said he's never had anybody come back. <laughs> um, but you know, there and there are there are a few things. There's uh, links to uh, Steve Bloom has uh, uh, something on his website. Uh, Dave Mitchell, you know, Keith Ferguson. They all have you know their answers to that question. And I think uh, the amalgamation of that knowledge is better than any one of us mm. giving our take on it. You know, because getting five getting five answers you know parts of each of those will apply to you you know whoever you are and wherever you're coming from right yeah are there any uh upcoming projects that you'd like to tease us with that you're going to be working on like any new stuff that's that's in your your your, your world whether it be real you know live action or, or voice acting let's see we're doing uh, more clone more clone wars more futurama more family guy um uh, for people who are in L.A., uh, I'm doing an improv show in April and May at the Groundlings Theater uh, called The Black Version, um, which is a group of improvisers, myself, uh, Gary Anthony Williams, Jordan Black, Cedric Yarbrough from uh, Reno 911, uh, Daniel Gaither from Mad TV, um, doing the – we'll take a, a suggestion of a classic or iconic movie and then do the black version of it. And it's been selling out. It's gone really well. It's a really funny show. Very politically incorrect, but a lot of fun. <laughs> um, what else is going on? Um, uh, I'll be... Uh, huh. I think that's it. I just worked on uh, Jason Marsden's uh, web series, Space Guys in Space. Uh, not sure when that's going to be uh, posted. Um, but uh, I believe... Gosh, I don't know if there are more Avengers episodes coming or or, or if there are still more to air. Um, right. And there should be, I think, a few more Young Justice episodes that haven't aired yet. 
Yeah, because you play uh, Aquaman in that. And uh, and Double X. And Double X. Okay, cool. Um, you mentioned your Facebook fan page. Uh, where can people? Is that where people can interact with you online, or yeah, um, any other avenues yeah, online that people? I'm also can... on on Twitter at at Philomar. You know, uh, one long word, uh, two L's in the middle, two R's at the end. Right. Um, I like that. Maybe you should stop talking about at Phil Lamar in the third person and just ask him for the interview. <laughs> that was your well, reply. It was, that, it was that funny, was your... actually, Mike, Mike, you had had you contacted me in the past? I had contacted your your agents your your through DPN. I had contacted the people there, and they okay. had said, "We're sorry at this time, Mr. Lamar just doesn't have time." Um, right, right, and I had right. sent you a couple of previous emails to the to the. To, to your website, website right? address, yeah. and 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 I just find it funny because I was like I was like well I just finished recording the Static Shock episode and I really wish we could have gotten an interview with Phil Lamar and well here we are now 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 we've got you <laughs> I know yeah it's and, and I'm I'm sorry that the timing uh, didn't it's work okay. out right now yeah it's um, it's all right. Um, we would like to thank Mr. Lamar for taking the time to chat with us here in this special interview. We will ask you to hold the line, and we will be back after this. Now somebody, anybody, everybody scream! There's squirrels in my pants! That girl's got some serious squirrels in her pants. There's squirrels in my pants! Tell me what's making you jump like that. Ain't got no chickens, ain't got no rats. Wow, she had actual squirrels in her pants. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Slight, just slightly under an hour is the actual interview clip time for Phil Lamar. Uh, yeah, you 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 take it, dude. Uh, yeah, it was awesome. I, besides technical difficulties, it was an amazing opportunity to talk to this icon of animation acting yeah acting in general yeah I, it was just you know it's like i said on the on the jason morrison interview which you weren't on but hopefully you'll go back and listen to i love it when i can just sit here and just kind of you know listen to stories um of what you know the person has done and, and phil was so so gracious um, so, so awesome to, uh, to have him, this time. <laughs> yeah, to, to, to have him dedicate some of his time to us. Very, very cool guy to talk to. Um, I would love to meet him in person. Uh, but just, just being able to talk to him, it's so, so well, well done. Uh, you have any other thoughts other, other, other than squeeing like an emotional fanboy? Um, yeah, I actually kind of want to see him at <laughs> San Diego Comic Con. <laughs> <laughs> Get him a, bull, a bullhorn. Ah, yeah. That would be so awesome. But, um, yeah. I, he's so... It was. It, he seemed very laid back and very awesome. I, yeah, he's very, very cool. And, yeah, I mean, you know, right right now is just so, so awesome to, to talk to him. And, and, yeah, so... I think that's going to do it for this interview. Like I said in the in the in, intro to the interview, you're going to hear this uh, on Tooncast's uh, RSS feed and on the Secret Origins RSS feed as well. Um, and that's it for now. I am TF2 and Mike, and you are Lupus Convoy. Until next time. Ah, you must be the new mechanic. Right, Gil Cooper. Hello, Mather. So, Gil, if you're a mechanic, I suppose you know how to change a Lorenz sensor on a Cessna 402. What's the matter, Gil? You don't know how, do you? Well, sure. You reach behind the altimeter and feel for the metal Y connector, unplug the left side, find the blue wire, thread it to the new sensor housing, reseal the base unit, plug in the test coordinates, and you're in business. <laughs> the blue wire? Hi, I'm Phil Lamar, voice of Green Lantern in Justice League, and you're listening to the GeekCast Radio Network.